Hello everyone, I'm going to speak about life evolution on Earth, of course, and uh, the importance of fossils as uh, examples illustrating evolution. So to ask directly to the title, is a fossil a witness of evolution? The reply is directly yes, of course, and we will see why, and we will see how life is going on on Earth, and what was the past before us, and uh, what, what is important in terms of paleontology. So I like to start with this uh, almost uh, fossilized object, which is uh, one of the, the first uh, step of uh, the humankind on the moon, because it's going indeed to be fossilized, as it's the case of other kinds of fossils. Uh, this one is from the Jurassic, and it belongs to a theropod, dinosaurs. So dinosaurs were uh, important reptiles, and within the group of dinosaurs, you have different species which evolved, uh, including uh, in the present, today, birds actually are dinosaurs, feathered dinosaurs, but they, they are dinosaurs according to our classification, according to the phylogeny, actually. And we know dinosaurs from the past thanks to different kinds of fossils. Fossils uh, is a large group of uh, objects we are studying as paleontologists and here you can see one of the first uh, kind or one of the first type of fossil which is called an ichno fossil which means a, a, a footprint or a track. So we don't have the skeleton, we don't have the direct object but we have a kind of imprint, a natural imprint, which yield important uh, data concerning the dinosaurs itself. It's not a leading anatomy, morphology, because there is no, again, bone, there is no teeth, which are also with, uh, important in terms of uh, uh, remains to study as paleontologists. But this kind of footprints they yield important information concerning the locomotion, for example, the size of the animal, uh, and so on, the behavior. We, we even have some uh, footprints in the uh, Cretaceous or in the Jurassic showing that uh, uh, the animal was walking, then it stopped, and then it turned. So the, the, the sense of the footprints turned back and we don't know why. It's, it's like a snapshot of a behavior a million years ago, and this is like the clues of the detective who needs to make his uh, or her inquiry to, uh, to give as, much, uh, as many data as possible. So footprints are, are, are studied in different ways, of course. Here you can see a photogrammetry. Uh, we are using precise different kinds of photo to have uh, a very uh, detailed view of the relief of the object and every uh, footprint is recorded now like that thanks to this methodology uh, which allows to study and to analyze precisely the, the differences between the footprints because as you know if you are wearing different kinds of shoes you will stay the same, but you will leave different traces behind you. So it's this exactly the same. The, the footprints itself depends on the substract. So uh, the matter on, on which the dinosaurs or, or others uh, extinct species were, uh, were walking or were on which they, uh, they were moving. And it depends on your size. It depends on your uh, dermal cover behind the feet and so on. So we need to uh, analyze precisely all the differences, all the distributions of the variations of these footprints to have a better uh, and the, the, the a more precise identification as possible. So concerning the bones, uh, here we have uh, concerning the T-Rex, which, which is a kind of a big star in, in the vertebrate paleontology, we have many, many fossils from uh, North America, even if we have uh, another species from Mongolia, which is Tyrannosaurus batahar. Uh, batahar means the king in Mongolian language. So it's very close to the T-Rex, but it's not the T-Rex itself. So most of the 
I would say, Tyrannosaurus skeletons are from the Cretaceous of North America. And you have here behind me, I will try to, to stay alive, uh, you have a very nice skeleton which is reconstructed in, in, in 3D thanks to the 3D itself preservation of every bone. So from this uh, specimen to this uh, reconstitution, this Hollywood reconstitution extracted from the, uh, the uh, Jurassic world, uh, you have a wide range of possibilities, of course, because uh, a reconstruction is involving uh, an artistic touch because uh, we don't know all concerning the T-Rex, for example, we have skeletons, we have some footprints, we have some uh, imprints of the, the body, so we have the impression of some scales, but we don't have the color, we don't have the texture, we don't have the, the skin on the wall body itself, so this, what you see behind me, is just a reconstruction, it depends on the, the way we are understanding the organism, organisms and maybe it will be wrong in one decade or less depending on the new discoveries we will uh, we will make in the future so uh, a, a reconstitution of extinct life actually depends on the way we are understanding the species uh, for example if you take another uh, another dinosaur species like iguanodon in the last century, we were thinking that the iguanodon was a kind of very fat and very slow quadrupedal reptile with a horn at the level of the nose. But thanks to further discoveries, we know now that the iguanodon is an almost bipedal dinosaur, very rapid, very uh, uh, relatively light. And uh, the, the horn, we were thinking it belongs to the nasal bone, is actually a kind of uh, phalanx terminating the, the first digit. So we completely rethought the reconstruction of the iguanodon from, uh, from Belgium, actually. So what is interesting is uh, from the fossils you have, uh, you have the, the, the field of paleontology, which is studying fossils themselves, but you have also this kind of artistic touch which lead to many, many novels, many, many comics, including the, the death ones from Michael Crichton, the Jurassic Park, of course, which is itself not so far from the Conan Doyle's uh, novel called The Lost World, because in both cases you can see dinosaurs alive. So it's possible today when observing birds, when you are uh, doing uh, birds uh, watching, you are in one way observing living dinosaurs because we will see that uh, birds today are feather dinosaurs. But the trick of uh, Michael Christian is very, is very clever actually because he used fossils to uh, allow the characters to observe the dinosaurs alive thanks to this uh, blood remain preserved in a mosquito itself preserved in a fossilized plant resin called amber which is which is existing of course it's a very important for us because it's what we are calling exceptional preservation cases because it's fixing the organisms uh, actually, the, the, the resin is flooding along the trunk and by, uh, by flooding, it's, it's uh, sticking life which is uh, living around the trunk, in the trees and so on. So we have many, many insects preserved in ambers. We have even some uh, feathers of protobirds or dinosaurs. We have uh, lizards, we have all uh, ecological elements uh, very well preserved and uh, they are very old, they are uh, uh, minimum 60 million years if of course there are some amber which are younger, some other ambers 
which are older, but uh, here you can see a mosquito which is fossilized in an in a amber. So fossilization is a very important process because uh, the way you are going to be fossilized uh, is, uh, is, uh, is directing actually the way how uh, one will study you in the future. So concerning another good type of fossilization here, you have the mammoth, which is uh, preserved thanks to the permafrost in Siberia, for example. The soil of Siberia is frozen and the uh, freezing process preserves organic matter. And this is another case of exceptional preservation for us because if you have organic matter, then you have direct access of what usually we could, uh, we could have because a fossil is a permineralized uh, remain of uh, generally the most important uh, part of your organism, the harder part of your organism, which means the teeth and the skeleton if you are a vertebrate. If you are an insect, you have more chances to preserve your exoskeleton, which is made of uh, chitin. If you are a crustacean, a crab or, or a lobster, for example, you will have your exoskeleton as well, which is going to be preserved, but it will contain uh, calcium and uh, this uh, chitin, which is a very uh, solid, very hard protein, which is preserving with time. So generally, we don't have uh, feathers, we don't have uh, all what we call the faner, which is the dermal cover of the organism. In the case of mammoth, what's interesting is that uh, we, we are looking for fresh DNA to uh, extract from a sexual cell of the mammoth and to re-put or we reboot in one way in a living species of elephant of today. So this is technically, let's say, it's possible thanks to the uh, artificial insemination process, which is relatively well masterized. But uh, the trick is to discover a fresh sexual cell of the mammoth. Uh, and for the moment, it's not the case. So when you are uh, reading newspapers or articles about the resurrection of the mammoth, it's uh, most of the case a mediatic scoop uh, which is not uh, often based on scientific data, let's say. But was, what is important for us in case of the DNA, or the, the, the fossil DNA, is what we call the paleogenetician studies. And paleogenetics is a, 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 a true, a complete field of studies of pale uh, within the paleontology. And we are indeed using fossilized DNA not to uh, these extinct, extinct species or to rebirth extinct st species, but to better understand them by molecular phylogeny. The, the, the trick of molecular phylogeny behind me is that uh, we are comparing DNA of recent elephants with part of the DNA we have from different species of, of the mammoth. And we realize that first the mammoth is not the direct ancestor of the modern elephants. It's just a cousin, and this is what we, we are doing actually based on the wall skeleton of the mammoth. Uh, we are, uh, when we are studying phylogeny, we put all the species at the same level, and uh, the, the, the game, if I could say, is to uh, make the links, to analyze the relations between the organisms, which are uh, cousins' relations. They are not directly related uh, from an ancestor to a living species. Uh, the fossilization process is very important and it occurs in different steps. Uh, first, you have the living organisms. This is the first uh, step which is living, which is reproducing and so on, eating. And one, one day it's going to, to, to die. So the cadaver uh, must be relatively quickly covered by sediments and by water to stop the oxidation process because the DNA 
doesn't like the oxidation process as well as most of the tissues. And then when it's almost completely covered, uh, then with time and depending on the physical chemical conditions of the soils, uh, the uh, mineral matter of the soil is entering within the structure of the skeleton and uh, uh, the, the organic matter of the skeleton is diffusing within the soil. So this is why we are uh, speaking about a pear mineralization process, which is actually a kind of petrification. It's the, the classical way uh, to be fossilized. But if you are fossilized, again, it doesn't mean that uh, you will be studied by uh, by paleontologist or, or someone else. Um, we need, we need, uh, there is a parameter, there is a chance parameter which is important in, in terms of discovery. Because first, we need to have access to different layers. The layers are important because they are uh, strata, uh, sedimentary uh, rocks, which uh, contain or not uh, fossils. So we, when we are prospecting, actually, we are working on the surface uh, of which we know the age, thanks to uh, previous geological works. We have geological maps. We open the maps. Uh, uh, I'm working on what happened before dinosaurs. So. Uh, different geological periods called Permian or Triassic in between the, the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic. So when I'm opening a, the geological map of the world, we will see one. Uh, I'm focusing my field expedition in the regions on which the sediments has exactly uh, the period of time I'm interested on. So uh, this is the first step. The second step is then we are walking on this uh, surface. Uh, we prefer uh, deserts than forest uh, regions, not uh, because we don't like trees, but we prefer to have direct outcrops, actually uh, uncover outcrops to have a better vision of, uh, of the sediments uh, on surface. And um, this evolution of life is very uh, long according to our human scale. Uh, our time unit is the year. Uh, the maximum, let's say, time span is around one century as human being. Uh, in terms of paleontology, the, on, on geology, of course, the time unit is the million of years. Uh, so it's less than the billion of years for the astrophysicians, for example. It's often represented as a kind of spiral, the spiral of the uh, time of the Earth. And uh, what is interesting is to see that there is a, a relatively quick turnover uh, because we calculated the, the older age of the fossils for one species, for one well-known species. We have uh, the oldest fossil and the younger fossil. So we know that in average, it's a global average time period, but if you are an invertebrate, which means in an insect, uh, an arthropod, uh, a worm, and so on, you have as species, of course, not as individual, you have a, a lifespan of 10 millions of years. If you are a vertebrate, this is our case, the time span is in average just one million of years. So they are very global statistics. But uh, what is interesting is that life uh, appears finally relatively quickly because the Earth is around 4.5 billion of years. Early life is around three point something, if not four billions. So in, I would say, 500 million years, you have already life which appear on Earth. And taking that into account and thinking about the rapid turnover, you can uh, relatively easily, let's say, imagine that life could appear uh, elsewhere in a relatively not so old planet, depending, of course, of the, 
of the conditions. And but but if life, if there is life uh, outside Earth, we have more chances that this life is fossilized, because um, it would be, uh, let's say, anthropocentric to say that life is living at the same time than us. So taking into account the Earth history, we have more chances to find possible life forms as fossils outside the Earth system. But for the moment, uh, we don't know. We know on Earth that life is very complex, evolves very quickly, uh, and it depends on the system Earth itself, which is made of tectonic plates. And tectonic plates are also very important in terms of life evolution on Earth. Uh, here you can see a map of the world today with different spots, uh, yellow spots. One spot is an, uh, a movement, uh, a seism. Uh, and uh, it, the, 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 the repartition of the spots corresponds to the limit of the tectonic plates. So you can see the African tectonic plate very easily, which contains Africa itself as a continent, but also part of the uh, Southern Atlantic Ocean, part of the Indian Ocean, and so on. So this is moving, and everything is moving. The, the, the speed of the plate is not uh, sensible for us, because the movement is around four, is between three, let's say, and six centimeters per year. So it's for us, it's nothing. You can stay uh, at the edge of a tectonic plate. You will never see the plate moving, except in case of uh, seismic uh, problems, let's say. But uh, this is to say that uh, life is evolving with the plates. And uh, there are cycles, because uh, in the past, uh, all the continents, all the plates were gathered in what we call Pangaea. But before Pangaea, uh, we, ha we, we have another uh, configuration of the tectonic plates. And uh, this is what we call actually the Wilson cycle. You have uh, different uh, movements in the crust, at the level of the, the crust on Earth, different movement which is uh, relative to the opening, the tectonic zip is, uh, let's say, creating oceans. But when two plates are, are meeting each other, they are uh, forming a mountain chain. So it depends on uh, the configuration. And here you will see a very short video summarizing the movement of the plates themselves. There is a small uh, count uh, bottom right of the picture. Uh, with the million years turning very, very quickly. So you can see that uh, before Pangaea, the plates themselves uh, were, were moving. Pangaea is not the cradle of uh, life, because before the, the tectonic plates were, let's say, playing. So if you want to work on dinosaurs, for example, today, you take a, a geological map of the world, and you will detect the region of the world uh, on which you have interesting sediments, potential discoveries uh, dated from the Triassic, uh, Jurassic, Cretaceous, so between 250 million years to 66 million years, what we call the Mesozoic era, because this is during this era that dinosaurs uh, evolved. And you are planning field expeditions. So if you are working on uh, what happened before, uh, before dinosaurs, you will zoom on different parts of the, of, the, uh, of the world, like in Africa, for example. Here you can see the geological map of Niger, which is, uh, the, the, uh, let's say, in the center of, or near the center of Africa. It's interesting for us because it's almost uh, completely covered by the Sahara, and uh, thanks to the previous geological works, we know that uh, the sand 
is coming from different plateaux of, uh, of Craton, of different ages, and we worked with uh, colleagues from North America, South Africa, and Niger, of course. We uh, worked there to look for and to find uh, more, uh, more amphibians and reptiles uh, of, the, uh, of Permian age, so uh, animals, vertebrates, tetrapods of around 260 million of years. This is a photo of our camp because we are um, walking in, let's say, relatively isolated regions of the, of the world. We are using the dunes to, to climb on and to uh, detect uh, the, what we call the, the reg. The reg is the typical uh, uh, pebble desert and uh, there is the erg, which is a sandy desert. So we prefer to directly uh, watch and observe the uh, uh, reg surface, of course, because this is the surface of the, of the sedimentological layer. So this is a, a nice uh, photo of the dune here. Then uh, you have another photo of our camp uh, at the end of the day. This is the surface of what we call the Moradi formation. Moradi is the name of a Tuareg village, not so far from this uh, region of Sahara, on which you can see apparently pebbles on the foreground of this photo, but if you look closer, they are not pebbles, they are directly fossils. They are remains of bones, and I like the comparison between the Sahara region here on the left and the Mars surface on the right of the photo. Here you can see a nice photo of Roger, a geologist colleague from South Africa, brushing and cleaning a very nice vertebral column, which is eroded by the, uh, the sand winds, which are almost uh, not permanent, but very frequent in this part of the, of the desert. So you need first a chance to detect uh, very small, bo or not small actually, but uh, the first remains, and you need a chance, a good chance, to uh, detect that at the right time. If you are coming too late, the sand completely destroyed and turned all the skeleton into dust. Uh, if you come too early, you will see nothing because the surface is not enough eroded to deliver the vision of the fossil on the ground. So there is a, a temporal, a temporal uh, window which is necessary to discover interesting fossils. So how we proceed now on the field, we are, when we find the, uh, a fossil like that, which is a very nice uh, vertebral column, we dig uh, a, a small tranche, we dig a, a kind of hole all around the structure we are, we are seeing. We test, of course, we, we brush and we clean everything to see if there they are or not connections between the bones, but once uh, there is no more connection, then we dig a small, uh, a small tranche all around the, the structure and we, uh, we put plaster, we put first journal paper uh, to protect the fossil, then plaster, we make a kind of cocoon to transport the fossil to the closest laboratory, paleontological laboratory, which is in this case uh, Paris. Uh, and uh, then we, we are asking to the uh, travel uh, companies to have this kind of uh, uh, cocoon of plaster. Uh, they cannot see what there is inside, so they have to trust us that uh, they, this is not a bomb, this is a fossil, and we are studying proto-dinosaurs for science and to better, to better know life evolution and so on. So there is a long process of preparation, of, uh, of prospection, and I would say of diplomacy to allow the data to be really uh, exploited in, in the laboratory. And when it's coming in, uh, in a paleontological laboratory, the first step, we don't take the skeletons like that, and we, we don't exhibit them in the, in the museum. There are, there are many different stages in between. 
The first uh, and very important step is the preparation. We need to clean uh, everything to have uh, access directly to the, to the bone, uh, poss possibly in 3D. So there is a long period of time of uh, mechanical preparation, sometimes chemical preparation depending on the uh, composition of the rock, composition of the sediment. If it contains some uh, calcareous, some carbonates, then we are using different types of acid. Of course, we are doing some tests before to, to don't have bad surprises, but uh, this is the way how we are working. Uh, in the case of this kind of uh, rocks, they are mostly sandstones, so based on silicates, we, are, we, we can't use um, chemical preparation or we are mixing, but the mechanical preparation is uh, finally uh, very important. Uh, the colleagues are using a, a sand jet machine, which is by percussion or by uh, erosion is cleaning the, uh, the sedimentary mat matrix all around the fossil. So this is the, the result. We have a, a nice view of uh, Gérald, the colleague, which is a preparator in paleontology. This is a real uh, job. <laughs> and, and this is a very important job be because this is thanks to, to Gérald or other preparators that we have access to our uh, primary data. And then we are uh, comparing the, the, the bones themselves, we are drawing them, we are describing in different views, uh, like anatomists, we are after all anatomists, and uh, we are doing comparative anatomy. Uh, when we find something which is different, we need to be sure to have compared this bone with all the bones from all the museums of the world to be sure it's different or not. If it's not different, maybe this bone uh, is uh, giving new data on the anatomy of the locomotion because it's a limb bone, for, ex for, ex for example. But, but if it's a new thing, then we need to be sure. And if it's not related to any, anything already known, we are, let's say, obliged to create a new species waiting for a reply in nature or science, depending the, on, on the journal, it doesn't matter actually, but this is how we, we proceed actually. Uh, we based a new species description on, on a, a list of new characters, we are calling that a diagnosis. We test the new character or not with phylogeny by putting all the characters of uh, the morphological characters in a data matrix with the, a long list of species, we call that the taxa, and a long list of characters, and we are using parsimony softwares to uh, link the species, and then to test the relationships on the new or not character of what we are find, finding. So here, you can see a nice anatomical plate, because this is the, the basis of the publication. Uh, we put the object, the skull, or the, what we find, uh, in different views, lateral view, dorsal view, ventral view, we are describing as our surgeons, actually, uh, uh, anatomi anatomically speaking, what we are uh, observing, and we are trying to detect new characters, new uh, uh, anatomical characters. So this is uh, here, this is a, a, an anatomical plate of a reptile which lived on Pangaea before dinosaurs' time. This is a Pareiasaurian. It was uh, based on the type of the teeth. It was uh, uh, an herbivorous of good size. It, 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 it was the size of a cow, let's say, two meters, I would say, two or three meters, depending on the, the genus and the, the species. And uh, this gives important information of the, the fauna of the past, before, during, or after the dinosaurs, it doesn't matter actually, but this is thanks to these elements that we are understanding the different ecosystems on Pangaea, on after, and uh, we are completing the data with what we call histological data. Here you can see a histological section, we are cutting, when we have several specimens of the same type, 
or thanks to a CT scan now, which is a non-destructive methodology, we are scanning the inner part of the fossil and we can, we can see a lot of things actually. We can see if the animal was aquatic, was amphibious, was terrestrial. We can detect sometimes at the cortical level, at the, uh, the, the, uh, around the surface of the, the bone, depending on the bone of course, but sometimes we can see lines of arrested growth, exactly like the, 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 the trunks we are cutting, uh, we can count the number of lines to have an idea about the age of the tree when we cut it. With the, this kind of uh, fossil, it's almost the same. We have uh, lines of arrested growth, which indicates uh, not necessarily the age of the individual when it died, but at least the rhythm of its own development. So we have data on the morphology, on the, the anatomy, on the diet, based on the, 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 teeth, the tooth morphology. We have data on the ontogeny, which means the development, thanks to uh, what we call skeletochronology or bone histology. On here, uh, we uh, propose, after all these processes, a, reconstru a reconstruction. Uh, we put all the anatomical plate and we put first uh, an osteological reconstruction of the Dyspareazorian and then we are working with what we call paleo artists. They are artists not from the Paleozoic but artists specialized in paleontological reconstitutions. They are very often naturalist artists, bird watchers, or herpetologists, amateur herpetologists and so on and they help us to uh, add the different layers in 3D or in 2D after the bones we add the ligaments, uh, the attach uh, from the bone to the muscles then from the ligaments we add another 3D or 2D layer uh, of, of the muscles themselves and then then from that you have the, the silhouette of the animal and then we add the, the dermal layer. The, the, the last layer is the, the dermic one. And the dermic one, if you don't have data, you will use what you know from the most closest species based on your phylogeny, which is preserving the uh, dermal layer by osteoderms or some feathers eventually or this is how we are working. We are filling the gap even at the level of the osteology because a, a complete skeleton you can see that yes in Jurassic Park or Ju Jurassic World but not in the reality. Uh, you, we, ha we have often uh, partial skeletons, even sometimes partial bones but from that, you have to reconstruct based on what you know uh, from the morphology itself, but you are filling the gap from, uh, according to the, the, the closest species. So this is a nice 3D reconstruction here of the Pareazorian. And actually we are working as uh, this, uh, this is to explain you how we are working. This, this is like a comics from left to the right you have the 3D scan of the skull, then we add layers of the uh, eyes balls, the tongue, the muscles of the jaw, and step by step we are reconstructing the uh, robot portrait. I don't know exactly the word in English, but uh, the, the, let's say the, the profile, like profilers, uh, the profile of the, of the beast. So step by step we are working with this kinds of uh, artists which are very helpful because they, uh, they give, let's say, life to our very chirurgical way of, uh, of thinking because, uh, because we are, let's say, formatted to publish anatomical plates in, in, in certain types of articles and so on. So it's very interesting to work like that with, uh, with them. So we are even using some uh, interesting uh, instrumentations like drones sometimes. Here you have a photo of a very small 
uh, but nice uh, city in southern France, in the Var region, called Gonfaron. And Gonfaron is interesting for us because this is one point or one spot in France uh, where you can find Permian sediments, so which means rocks uh, which were uh, sediments of around 280 million years old. And in the sediments, uh, we found interesting fossil amphibians, but the problem is this is, this is above the, the, the nice uh, city of Gonfaron at the level of a cliff. So we, we, we found uh, a small uh, uh, bones, uh, remains, bones, pieces, which rolled in the slope at the bottom of the cliff. Uh, and then when we reach the bottom of the cliff, we uh, observe, of course, the different layers, what we call stratigraphy. We made a stratigraphical profile, but we didn't reach the wall section, of course, because uh, it's vertical, and then we uh, use drones to have a vertical vision of uh, what happened in terms of sedimentology and stratigraphy. And it's very helpful. There is here a photo of the colleagues uh, working directly uh, on the layer which, uh, which yield uh, fossils. But uh, here you have uh, nice, uh, uh, nice photos of, uh, of the drone which, uh, which will help also to uh, try to follow the layer because we have, uh, we have almost horizontal layers in this, in this, in this region and we can follow uh, horizontally uh, the extension, the lateral extension of this kind of, uh, of uh, river sediments, a uh, uh, rock uh, flow which, uh, um, which eroded the surface of the landscape at that time with possible cadavers in the soil again of that time. So uh, here you can see the, the photo of the cliff and here you can see a distant uh, photo of the colleagues working at the uh, very precise level. This is what we call a bone bed. Uh, it's a bed of rock full of disarticulated uh, bone remains. So this is like a giant 3D puzzle. We need to identify exactly uh, what kind of bone we have. Is it a partial femur? Is it a partial jaw? Is it a partial humerus? And so on. Of which kind, of which type? Reptile, amphibians, and so on. And then we have to um, complete uh, the, the puzzle. So it's a very long process before, of course, to have this final uh, step uh, speaking again, again on about the, the T-Rex. Uh, so now you have, a, I hope, a better vision of what, what is the, the, the real uh, paleontological w uh, work in terms of vertebrate paleontology at least. Uh, we, are, we are not taking fossils directly from the field, uh, exhibiting them directly in the museums. There is a long uh, step of different uh, stages. Uh, this is a very nice exhibition here uh, on the T-Rex and the T-Rex is, is, is again a kind of star because we have several almost complete skeletons uh, from the US so it helps a lot to better understand the, the, the species first and the individuals because the more complete skeletons you have, the more data you have on the same species then you can understand the growth, what we call the ontogeny, because you will find uh, young individuals, you will find old individuals, so you will have a, a view of uh, which kind of, uh, which part of the body is growing first or before another uh, part of the body, what we call a growth allometry, which is important uh, in terms of uh, sometimes species evolution. And you will have a, a vision of the what we call uh, intraspecific variation. Sometimes we have males, females, 
And it's very uh, interesting to see that sometimes there are differences as we can find differences in primates, in our case, and in different other clades of, uh, of different groups. So here you have another skeleton in the North American Museum. Here you have uh, uh, another one. So uh, there is here uh, a, a an anatomical plate of the T-Rex with some individuals, not all, but some uh, interesting individuals, almost complete skeletons, uh, which are sometimes scanned in 3D. Every bone is scanned, and then we are uh, building the model in 3D, and we are using and on, on studying what we call biomechanics, so the possible angles of each articulation to better understand how the skeleton itself uh, was moving. So, of course, based on the, uh, the shape of the bone, sometimes uh, there is a, a natural expansion on the bone, what we call an apophysis, and the size and the shape of the apophysis is linked, directly linked, with the size and the uh, importance, let's say, of the muscle. So, based on the, only the osteology, you are able uh, to have or to reconstruct the myology, so the muscles uh, envelope. Uh, here you have a reconstruction of the muscles of the T-Rex. Uh, of course, sometimes when we don't have data, it's based on, okay, I already uh, said that uh, it's based on the, the, the species which is the closest species uh, within the group, but sometimes it's based on the um, uh, living species, because sometimes you don't have the choice. Uh, in terms of dinosaurs, uh, especially the theropods, uh, the good living models today are birds. So this is one way, let's say, funny to say that the T-Rex has more common DNA with a, a, a chicken than with a diplodocus, uh, because it's another clade, it's another natural group, and the uh, birds and theropods are, uh, let's say, linked together. So, uh, from this reconstruction, you, we can put inside, even if it's not fossilized, this is, this is the working hypothesis, we can put inside uh, the uh, intestines, uh, the liver, the blood system, and so on, depending on the thermophysiology. And the thermophysiology is linked with the kind of bone you have. If your bone is of certain time, type, then you will have a certain thermophysiology, which is cold blood, or warm blood system, or in between, let's say. And it depends on the, on the species of the dinosaurs. And uh, uh, there is another interesting fossil I didn't uh, speak for the moment, is the coprolites, which is the fossilized excrement of the animals. Even if it's sometimes difficult to know who laid uh, the excrement, uh, excrements, fossilized excrements, copro is excrement and lithos is the stone, so coprolite is the, let's say, technical term, technical name of these kinds of fossils, they are important because we are using uh, light bones, actually, we are using uh, CT scans or, or classical sections uh, to uh, observe what there is inside and uh, we can rebuild, reconstruct the ecological or trophic chain of different uh, individuals. So coprolites, bones, teeth, uh, bone structure, of course, footprints, there are many, many fossils, uh, and, and, and plants, of course, uh, plants are going to be fossilized exactly like animals, depending on the, um, the hardness of the, the structure, usually the trunks, when you have a, a trunk structure uh, with lignin inside, you have good, let's say, good chances of fossilization. Uh, sometimes only the leaves are preserved. It depends on the, the climate. It depends on the uh, environments. 
it depends on, on many parameters, of course. But uh, plants uh, is very important in terms of paleontology. This is a, a proper field called paleobotany, which yields uh, many important information, like uh, like on the climate, like on the, the the type, the different types of the ecosystems you had at different times periods. Uh, here you can see uh, uh, different different types of uh, of plants fossils. We have pollens as well, uh, well preserved. So pollens are difficult to study because they are they, they are very very small, uh, microscopic. So you need a long chemical preparation, but it works. A uh, long preparation of the sediments put in different solutions to extract, to dissolve uh, the, 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 um, the mineral uh, or most of the mineral matter from your sediment. And then you have a long work of, um, of uh, preparation of the, the pollen grains or the palino palinomorph, because sometimes you have spores depending on which group of plants you are you are studying on and depending on the period and uh, they they yield important information as well in terms of uh, climatology uh, climate evolution uh, and so on so after all fossils fossils are important in terms of evolution because you can study of course species evolution thanks to living organisms because uh, they have DNA, they have their own uh, anatomy, they have their own osteology and so on. So you are able only uh, with living species to build phylogenetic, phylogenetical trees, of course. But uh, with the fossils, you will uh, extend the, the, um, the distribution, the, the, your, your, your vision actually of the trees uh, by, uh, by completing uh, the, the different branches. Uh, here, this is an example with the with the, the fish and the tetrapods transition. If you are observing today, the closest, uh, let's say, f I'm using fish, but it's not a natural group. We used to uh, to speak about uh, aquatic vertebrates, but the closest fish uh, uh, based on the tetrapods. Tetrapods are uh, all the amphibians reptiles, mammals, and birds, of course, around 30,000 uh, uh, species today. Uh, the, 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 the fish uh, which are close to this uh, natural group, uh, clad, a clade, is the, the lungfish, very peculiar fish from the known in Africa, in Amazonia, and in Australia. They have both breathing systems. They have gills and lungs. And they, they look like heels. They are very elongated with small, uh, small fins. But if you are looking uh, the bones of these fins, you will see that they are composed of almost the same bone elements of, of our arm, of the, uh, all the, 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 the four limbs of the tetrapod. So this is what we call an homology a structural homology and fossils are important because uh, they can uh, give more information uh, about the distribution and variations of these homologies. Uh, thanks to the fossils we know that uh, we fill the gap between the living lungfish and the early tetrapods. For example, we have the, uh, the silacanth, you know probably the story of the silacanth with which was considered as a, as a living fossils. I don't like this term because uh, actually a lot of species today, today would be uh, living fossils after all, but uh, this is interesting because it's a fish uh, which, uh, which is known by fossils of the dinosaur's age. And uh, we were thinking that uh, it uh, became extinct at the same time than most of the dinosaurs, so 66 million years ago, with the uh, uh, impact of the meteorite on the volcanism at, at that time. And uh, during the last century, a fisherman 
in his net discover a fresh uh, silicant. Uh, it was of course a, a big, a big news at that time. We discover uh, the living fossils, but when you are observing closer the, uh, the 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 fresh, let's say the fresh fish, you will notice some differences between the fossils we we have in in the paleontological collection and the characters directly observed on the living species. So it's important because uh, you will make the difference between the fossils and the living species. And uh, this is another step. This is another step uh, we are adding to the phylogenetical tree because now we know that thanks to the fossil, the fish tetrapod transition is well know, known thanks to different kinds of fossils uh, from, uh, from China, from North America, from Greenland, uh, you probably know uh, Tiktaalik or Ichthyostega from the Devonian and Greenland. So it's, it was a kind of giant salamander uh, known by different uh, fossils uh, and uh, it, it illustrates the uh, diversification of the almost tetrapods at that time in, on land, actually. So it's very interesting because by analyzing the fossils, you can, uh, you can better know the, the, what we call the important transitions during uh, the species evolution. It's working for the uh, uh, aquatic to the land transition, but uh, we have data of the radiation of the, of the species uh, in the aerial uh, mode of life uh, before birds, of course, today the, 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 the flying animals are typically the bats and the birds, on insects, of course, but uh, during the dinosaurs' times you, you had pterosaurians, for example, which are flying reptiles, very interesting. It's a complete extinct group, different from the birds, so fossils are important, of course, to study them, to better know them, and it's illustrating the uh, bricolage, actually, the evolution is uh, is, is doing to, uh, to try to, to adapt or not to different kinds of, uh, of ecosystems, uh, aquatic ones, terrestrial ones, aerial ones, and um, uh, fossils are, are showing us that actually the species evolution is a, a, a never-ending machine of new variations with wings of different types. If you, if you are a pterosaurian, you will have different wings that the birds, they have different wings that insects and so on. So you have a never ending machine of, of variations which are retained or not by natural selection. And even if you, are, if you have a, a super good uh, adaptive fitness or genetical fitness, uh, maybe you will, uh, you will meet uh, an impact of a meteor and uh, you, will, you will become extinct. So uh, this is not enough to, to be in good, uh, let's say, fitness with your environment. Uh, there are many, many uh, stochastics, uh, parameters to, to take into account to study life evolution as well. And I would like to, to finish with this funny picture of, uh, of a paleo artist uh, from Alaska. Uh, data is under your feet. So this is exactly summarizing actually the work of paleontology because we are working a lot when we are prospecting and then when we are uh, finding some first early remains of bone, then we stop, we put a GPS point, we continue our way, let's say, and uh, on the map we have uh, uh, we have different spots, different GPS spots, with uh, an evaluation of the density of the bone matter, and we decide or not to open uh, an excavation uh, field to extract the skeletons. So that's it. Thank you very much. And some references at the end about uh, uh, dinosaurs' tracks, because this is uh, how I, I started my, my talk today about uh, dinosaurs' tracks. 
on another book, uh, Health Before Dinosaurs, I had the chance to write in French, and which was uh, translated already some years ago. Thank you very much.